let's pray as we as we begin. Lord God, we ask that you would speak uh, into our hearts this morning, uh, and we pray for the person uh, who may have fallen in the back or what's I'm not sure what's going on there. We pray your hand of, of healing and protection be on them. We thank you that you care for us, you love us, uh, and be with them now. And uh, we thank you for your presence here. This is your time. This is your service. Help uh, us to remove any kind of distractions um, from our our head uh, that we can just fully be devoted to you and hear what it is that you have to say to us in your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, yeah, we're going to be talking about secret service this morning in uh, Matthew 6, 1 through 4. While I was looking up secret service agents, uh, you know, I found out some of the history because I was thinking like, why do secret service agents, why are they called secret service agents? Because there's nothing secret about them, right? I mean, they're, they, they, you can spot them really easily. They got the, they all look the same. Uh, sunglasses, phone cords in their neck, uh, suits, and uh, you know, what's, why is it called the secret service? Well, did you know that the secret service was, did not begin uh, as a protection for the president? The Secret Service was started by Abraham Lincoln back in the 1800s to stop counterfeit money. Uh, that during the Civil War time, over a third, so they estimate anywhere from a third to a half of all of our money was counterfeit. Uh, because there was, it wasn't centralized yet, every state was making their own money. And so uh, President Lincoln started this group, the Secret Service to go and combat counterfeit money that was very dangerous and it was secret at that time. Uh, but uh, then you had the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and uh, that didn't uh, get them to create new security. Uh, and then you had the, the uh, um, sorry, Grant, I think was then the next one, or Garvey, which was one of the ones. Uh, and then McKinley. It wasn't until after McKinley was shot, the third president that was assassinated, that they decided to create the Secret Service and at the beginning of night in the 1900s, 1901, uh, and uh, started by Teddy Roosevelt, who, uh, just kind of like we see in modern movies today and stuff, uh, escaped because you, you know Teddy Roosevelt he was a man, of man. and uh, so he adventures time he would escape his secret service and get away from them and different presidents were known to do that. President Taft would go on walks with his wife and then had to dodge the secret service so they could go out and do that. But uh, that's a little bit about the history of the secret service. So there still is today two branches of the secret service. There are the, the uniformed ones that we see and we know uh, and that aren't secret, but there is the secret secret service that are still count, uh, attacking and counterfeit money and things like that. Uh, and we have been called by Jesus, which we're going to read today, to be secret service, but not the ones that are up front uh, and uh, well known, but the ones to be actually secret. However, there are times that we're supposed to be known too. And so we're going to look at this uh, as well as when should we be secret and when should we not be secret? Are we always to be secret? Let's read in Matthew 6, 1-4. We're, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at uh, the call of Jesus is preaching to his disciples, saying this is what it looks like to be one of my followers. And now he's going to go into three different kind of acts of righteousness. We're going to look at one of those today. Uh, but Matthew 6, starting verse 1. says, be careful... Not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. To be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. So he's going to talk uh, here, he's talking about giving to the poor. Next week we're going to talk about prayer, 
and the third week we'll talk about fasting. And so uh, these are three acts of righteousness that could be done publicly and were being done publicly to get attention. And he is uh, going to call us to this more quiet, secretive act of uh, righteousness. Um, and uh, so, once a few things to note. First, it says whenever you give, whenever you give to the poor, what does that imply? That implies that we are giving to the poor. And there's different ways to do this. You, know, you can do this through through church. Uh, you give the church, and we give uh, portions. Uh, to help the poor. Uh, you can give directly to people who are asking or in need. You can hear about things and you can say, okay, they're, they're, they, they, they need something around. I know that they're a poor family. I'm going to bless them. All there are ways you can do this. Uh, but it's implied that we are doing this. Okay? We as Christians are called to do that. Uh, this, was, this goes on a, 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 from, the, from the early times. Jesus is or God always had an expectation of his people that they would be giving to the poor. Even back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, when uh, you had the Israelites um, in the promised land, God told them, you know, don't harvest all of your grapes. Leave some of the grapes on, and if grapes fall on the ground, leave them so that the poor could come in and pick grapes and have something to eat. Or when you harvest your fields at, at harvest time, don't harvest all the way to the edge of the field so you leave some so that the poor could come and glean from the fields. And so that was an expectation. We were thinking, even in how we do business, that our, you know, we can be thinking about this today. We're not all farmers, but, uh, and it always doesn't apply today to our walking around the farms and picking wheat today. But uh, in our society, what could we do? And we're, just, we're thinking about making money. It's like, uh, how can we be thinking about uh, creative ways to help the poor. Uh, and then in Deuteronomy 15, 11, it says, for there will never cease to be poor in the land, therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. Not being stingy, not, okay, I'll give you a little bit, because God, oh man, I gotta get a little bit. It's open wide your hand to the poor. And are we doing that? In Galatians 2.10, Paul uh, is talking about when, you know, he's got his mission to the Gentiles, and he took that, like, okay, is it okay for me to go to the Gentiles with the gospel? And he, and he goes to the leaders of the church, uh, Peter and James and all of them, and he says, okay, is this all right? And uh, they approved his ministry, he says, only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. So when they say to him, okay, yeah, Paul, you can go minister to the Gentiles, but make sure you're taking care of the poor. I mean, is that important that they had to like specify that and call that out? Don't just be about the gospel, the good news. That's important. You've got to give them the gospel, but make sure you're taking care of the poor. And Paul says, I was already eager to do that. It's something that is like, yeah, I'm going to take care of the poor. That's not something that any of us should neglect. So whenever you give to the poor, assuming you are doing that, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites in the synagogues and on the street. Uh, and so the, the word hypocrite here was first used as act for actors. So don't be like the actors. Don't be acting. Don't be saying, hey, uh, look at me, how much I care about the poor. And you really don't care about the poor. All you care about is people praising you for caring about the poor. You're acting. Don't be an actor. Don't be a hypocrite. Uh, and then, it says, do it in secret. Don't sound the trumpet. Uh, the, the trumpet could be a literal trumpet. Uh, it's possible. We don't know. Uh, there's a debate on this. Whether they actually were blowing a trumpet or having somebody blow a trumpet when they put their money in the offering to the poor. Um, or it could have been describing the boxes that they had to collect for the poor in the temple and in provinces for people that couldn't get to the temple. Uh, they would have boxes and they were in the shape of a trumpet. And so it could have been referring to that metaphorically. Uh, it, it could have been talking about the, the trumpet that was sounded for the call to worship. And then just kind of 
going with that as part of their uh, giving. We're not sure, or it could just totally be a metaphor, just like, don't be blasting a trumpet, and he's not really meaning they're actually doing that, uh, but don't be drawing attention to yourself. That's not what caring for the poor is about. And so we're supposed to give in secret. Now, does that mean that we're always giving in secret? I think people can take this to an extreme and miss what Jesus' point is. We're not always to give in secret. Because in the very first part of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew uh, 5, 16, Jesus talks about doing your good works, and he says, and that people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So if we're always doing it in secret, how is anybody going to see it and glorify our Father in heaven? Right? And he talks about a city on a hill can't be, be hidden. And we're supposed to be like the city on a hill, so our good works are shining before men. We're supposed to, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under the bed or covers it up. So the light's supposed to shine before men. But the purpose is so that they glorify our Father in, in heaven. So sometimes we are to be giving and doing acts of righteousness for people to see, but it's not to draw the attention to ourselves. It's to draw our attention to, to God, draw people's attention to God. Uh, this is where uh, John the Baptist's followers, right? He had all these disciples, all these followers, and then people started following Jesus. And so some of his followers came to him and said, John, so they're going and following that other guy that you baptized. And he says, yeah, that's, that's the point. You know, he says, he, says uh, he must increase, I must decrease. That's what it's about. Everything that I've done is not to increase myself or to get attention for myself. He's the one that everybody's supposed to be going to, not me. And so when Jesus says to give secretly, he said, if you can't, Give in a way that is drawing the people of God. Give secretly because it's not about you. And so uh, sometimes, yeah, we, we need to be public with it. Um, it is good to give anonymously. But sometimes it's good to let people know that you gave to them. Because then they know somebody in their church cares about them. You know, uh, we've, we've done... Both secretly and not secretly, and, and I remember, you know, one time we did something secretly, and then we heard that, that these people felt like nobody cared about them. I'm like, well, if they only knew what we had done for them, right? Uh, and it's like you want to tell, but it was not as you just got to then pray that they'll realize and, uh, that people care about them. Uh, but sometimes it's good to give it so they know that you care. And so it really comes down to what is our heart. Is our heart about drawing attention to us or is it about drawing attention to, to God? Uh, but sometimes we need to give secretly to analyze our own motives so we can figure out what is my motive. Because when we give secretly, that's hard. When we give anonymously. Uh, because we want somebody to know that we gave and so when we give anonymously, that can like uh, be a good time to reflect with God. Do I really care? Or do I just want people to know? Can I give secretly? Can I serve people secretly? Or do I have to serve in a way and make sure people know about it? This reminds me uh, of a time that uh, Krista and I, back in California, went to a, a black church. And uh, uh, I've got a friend who's an accountant in Texas uh, named Nina. She's a, a black lady. and everybody, just assume, everybody in the story is black, okay? Except from Chris and me. Uh, and so I don't have to say everybody, everybody's black. Uh, but it's important for the story uh, that everybody's black, except for me and Kristen, who are obviously not. Uh, but, uh, so, so Nina told uh, me, says, I'm coming to California with Kirk Franklin now. Who knows who Kirk Franklin is? Uh, he's a big uh, Christian singer, artist, and, uh, and, so, and she's his accountant. And so she says, I'm coming to Fine, California uh, with Kirk Franklin, and we're going to be at this, this church in L.A. 
and says, come on down if you want, and, you know, and I'll introduce you to Kirk Franklin. Like, That's cool. So, so Kristen and I got ready to go to this church, and I said, Kristen, if you've never been to a black church, uh, they dress up, like, really well, you know, like, fedoras <coughs> and, you know, suits and nights, and look, they look good when they go to church, they dress in the night. So we dressed up more than we would normally dress up for church. We get there, uh, and it's a big, big church. They, they own a couple different blocks, uh, or at least the corners of the blocks. They have two buildings. We were going to the youth building where it used to be talking. And so they had their own building on the corner. We walk in. We're the only white people, and uh, we were the only ones dressed up. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, were, they were sharp. They looked good. Uh, they were... The, the wearing probably stuff that cost, a lot of them cost more than what I had on, uh, but it was, you know, it was trendy and, you know, like that uh, stuff, not dressed up. And uh, Chris liked it, thanks a lot. And so we, we stood out for two reasons. One, we were, we were white and we were dressed up. But, uh, we, so we, we slipped, the, 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 the service was already started. We got there a little bit late to couldn't find the building. And, uh, so we kind of sneak in. There's like a thousand people in this thing. I mean, it's, it's huge. Um, uh, uh, big service. And uh, so we sneak in into one of the aisles in the pews and we're kind of in the middle of, of everybody. And uh, they're, they're rapping. Two guys are rapping the announcement. It was like awesome. Like, they're, 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 they're making up on spot raps as they're doing their announcements. Next time, Grant, Caleb, you can try that. And uh, videos are easy. Uh, but they're rapping freestyle. And uh, so it was really cool. We were enjoying this, this, this service a lot, uh, but we felt, you know, uncomfortable too. And so we're trying to fit in. So, so it was over singing and worship. You know, very few are moving. So I'm like, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna move. We're gonna get into this. And then all of a sudden, two guy uh, or a uh, guy, an usher with white gloves on, he comes to the edge of our aisle and he says, and he, and he points us out and calls us. And I'm like, what did we do wrong? Are we being too white? Are we out off the beat? Uh, and I'm like, what? <laughs> Which for me, uh, he, and uh, he says, come over, so like, okay, we're, we're like in the wrong section or something, like and uh, we, get, we get out there, and he says, you guys need his friends? I said, yeah, I said, she told us to look for two white people, and uh, <laughs> so uh, I said, we got a place for you, so we, they brought us down to the, the front where Kirk Franklin was, and we, you know, we sat with them up there, uh, but uh, he says, he, he, there's an interesting part of the sermon, the service, uh, which happens, and I don't know if this is indicative of most uh, black churches or not. I, I don't think so, but uh, I, it's, I've seen it happen a couple times. Uh, but for the for the giving, the offering, everybody gets up. Like the, the whole row stands up, and they walk down front, and they file, and there's the bucket to put your offering in. And they, they drop their buckets in, go back, the next row gets up, and they go down. It's everybody's, as the music's going, everybody's walking up. So you don't want to be sitting down in your pew, you know, as you're a kid. Now, I don't think that they were doing this for fanfare, you know, like to get draw attention to ourselves. But obviously it could be. It puts a little pressure on you to give, and you could maybe give for the wrong, wrong reasons. Uh, I think they were doing it out of an act of praise. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, it, it, you know, that's why some people really like to pass the plates during the, during the service, because it's part of an act of worship to give, and so this was like, the whole family, everybody's just doing it, getting up, and we had this part of our act of worship, and we're going to, you know, do it with our whole body, very expressively, uh, like they did the, the rest of worship, uh, but we can very easily, even having a box in the back, like we have right now, you're going to be putting it in there, making sure people are seeing you, putting your offering in, uh, as, as, as plates are passed. You can make sure that people are seeing that you're putting something in. <laughs> there can be pressure to, to give um, and make sure that people can know that you're giving. But God is calling us to do it. Jesus is calling us here in this uh, to, to, to give secretly. Um, and he says, because if you're doing it for the attention of others, so if I'm walking up here and I'm putting this in there and making sure everybody sees I'm putting in a bunch of money or they see me putting it in the offering in the back, it says, your reward is in full. So your reward is in full. What is he saying? He's saying that you want people's attention. There you got it. 
God is saying, no more reward for me. You, you got your reward in full. That's what you wanted. You didn't care about what I thought. You wanted the praise and approval of man, and you got the praise and approval of man. There's no more reward for you. And so, do we want the reward that God gives, or do we want the reward of man here in this life? And that begs the question, what is the reward that we get from God? What is this reward? He doesn't say, but in the Bible, a lot of times, it talks about future reward, our reward in heaven, store up treasures in heaven. And, uh, and I don't know for sure what this is, uh, but the reward from uh, that he's talking about that you are going to get paid in full here was not a physical reward. It was praise, right? Uh, so if people praise you, you get your reward in full. It's not money, that's not riches, it's not a mansion, it's not, you know, it's just you got praise, that's your reward. Perhaps our reward from God is also not anything that is material or physical, uh, a better house in heaven or something like that, but rather the praise of God. When we stand before God and he says, well done good and faithful servant. When I want to stand before God and when I, when I meet Him and not to feel humiliated, not to say, why didn't I do more? Why didn't I do better? No, I, you know, and uh, God looks at our life and it all just burns up because it was just we didn't do anything for Him and for the kingdom. It was all for ourselves. It might have looked good on the outside, but it wasn't. I want to get there to God and say, Jeremy, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. That's better than any other kind of reward that we could get in heaven. But he could be talking about some other kind of reward um, in heaven. He could be talking even about rewards on earth as well, because you know God does bless righteousness. Now it doesn't mean that it, when bad things happen to us, that it means that we're being cursed by God. It could. Uh, it doesn't mean when good things are happening to people that they're being blessed by God, but it could, right? Job is the story that shows us that this is a principle that God blesses those who do righteously and that and he curses those who are unfaithful. But like with the story of Job, Job was the most righteous guy on earth and all this bad stuff was happening to him. And so there are plenty of exceptions to that. So just because things are bad in your life doesn't mean that you're being disobedient and unfaithful to God, but it could. You know, we don't want to ignore the fact that, that God does reward us even in this life as well. Uh, but there are plenty of people that don't get, that have a very difficult life, but they are living fully for God. So uh, it, it could be an earthly thing too as well, uh, but I think the biggest thing is God's approval over man's so that's kind of the text there. Now, why? The, the, the big question is why do we do it? When we do acts of righteousness, whether that's prayer, whether that's fasting, whether that's giving to the poor, whether that's serving people, I mean, he just lists three, but there's plenty of acts of righteousness, things that we can do. Our motivation is what's important. And it's hard to judge somebody else's motivation. So this is for us to reflect prayerfully with God about our motivation. Now, I was had a friend in, in, uh, in Russia named Misha, who was not a Christian, but he spent two years with us, missionaries, and uh, I remember at the, the end of our, uh, uh, our time there, getting ready to come home, I was having this really good, heartfelt talk with him, and he's really starting to kind of open up to Christianity. He was a staunch atheist, still is, and uh, he said, Start talking about why we do good things, and I, I was explaining to him about salvation by grace, that we're saved by grace, it's not based on works, we don't have to earn our salvation. And he said, wait, 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 you're telling me that you do all these good things not to, to earn your salvation? Uh, like That doesn't make any sense to me. Like you guys are like, you Christians are like the, the nicest people I know. Like all my friends now are Christians. But I thought it's because you had to do that in order to go to heaven. 
and said, no. He said, well, this doesn't make any sense to me. I, I was kind of starting to think you guys made some sense, but now it doesn't make any sense to me at all. And he, he couldn't get past it. I mean, I, and I, and I, so I explained to him, I, I, I started going, numbering all the different reasons why we do good things, but it's not to earn salvation. And uh, he could not get past it. But he admitted that we were doing good things, and so it should be like evidence that, okay, these other motivations are sufficient. You don't need to earn your salvation in order to do good things. There's lots of cults. And religion, every cult and religion I was telling me requires good doing good things to earn your salvation. That's why they promote good works. Other religions tithe and give money to the poor. Other religions uh, do missionary work. Other religions do good things. And sometimes on the outside they do better things than we do. But it's because they're trying to earn their salvation. And he could not get that... Uh, <coughs> get past that. And so uh, I want to talk about some of the reasons, some, some motivations that we could have for doing good things other than to gain the praise of people. Because um, that's an obvious one, right? We're motivated to do good things to gain the, the praise of people. But there's another one that's also not a good one, but it's becoming very popular um, in our society, is the law of karma. Kids, you've heard the law of karma. I, I've had this quoted to me from one of my kids. Uh, it's being told out there, uh, this idea of, and you don't have to be uh, Hindu to believe in the law of karma. Uh, that's where it came from in Hinduism. But the law of karma is that if you do good things, good things will come back to you. And that motivates a lot of people in our society to do good things. If I just am kind to other people, then it's going to come back to me. And that is false. Right? Uh, even atheists believe this. It doesn't make any sense if there is no spiritual world, why there, how there even could be a law of karma. Uh, but it is not true that if you do good things, that good things come back to you. That's not biblical. And that's not a good reason to care about other people because it's not really caring about other people, uh, it's selfishness. It's just another form of me trying to get something for myself. And we got as Christians, we gotta really check ourselves. Why am I doing what I do? Is it really because I, in the end, wanna get something out of it? And it could be even uh, you know, a reward in heaven, right? I, I want a reward in heaven. And I struggle with this because in the New Testament, it's talked about a lot about, you know, building up the treasures in heaven and, and, and the, the, the eternal rewards. And should that be our motivation? It appears to be a motivation or a call to like, hey, do this so that you can have these treasures in heaven. But that would be self-seeking as well. Uh, and I, so I, I, you know, I think we need to, to have a better perspective about the, the eternal rewards. They are not our motivation to do good, but they are given to us or to, talk to us because it gives us hope that as we're struggling and sacrificing in this life, it is building something much more important for eternity. Um, and I think I think a lot of our eternal reward is going to be people who are in heaven because of what we did. And then somebody's going to come up to you and say, thank you for giving to HMBC because through that money, it went to this missionary, and I heard from that missionary the gospel, and I became a believer, and I'm here today because you put money in the offering. Or somebody else, because you shared the gospel uh, here. I'm in heaven now because of what you did and to see the people that are there because of things that we did that's that's a greater reward than anything else and uh, Paul says that of the Thessalonians says you are a crown he wasn't looking for an eternal crown to have on his head to wear to show off uh, all as good as you are a crown so uh, why do we do good things Sometimes we do good things of empathy, 
Animals do this. The animal kingdom has empathy for their own kind, and so they will show empathy to one another. That just makes us no better than animals if we're caring for people just out of empathy. Now, that's a good thing. We should have empathy for other people. But that should not be our only motive. And we, uh, there's this list of memes uh, that uh, somebody sent to our, our staff. It was like, there's a lot of bad news in the world today. And so here's some, some uh, illustrations of good things that are happening. And, and you know, there's these stories of people caring for other people. And it really, you know, it warms your heart. And it was, it was a nice thing. There's a bunch of them you scroll through. And one of them was a picture of an elephant with a baby cub in his trunk, a lion cub, sorry, uh, and the lion, the mom, walking next to him. So they're, walking, they're crossing this road. Lion's here, lion cub is in the trunk as they're walking side by side, and it says that on this hot Sahara day, this cub could not cross the road to get to the watering hole, so this elephant picked up the cub in his trunk and carried him and helped out the lion cub. Now for me, I'm thinking, that like to totally goes against my worldview, because Animals don't have morality. Humans do because we were made in God's image. In our soul, we have morality that goes beyond just mere empathy for our own kind. Right? Monkeys can show empathy to other monkeys, but to show empathy that goes beyond just, you know, like your own kind uh, or some selfishness, that's not part of the animal world. It didn't evolve. We didn't evolve. This is part of the reason why, just to show that we did not evolve, uh, but we were created in God's image. Something, something does not sit right with me about this. So I fact-checked it, and uh, sure enough, it was doctored, it was photoshopped. Uh, in fact, this, this meme first went out there by uh, Sleuth Lepra. It was put out there uh, by Sleuth Libra. And if you, if you write that backwards, it's April Fool's. It was an April Fool's joke. Okay. Uh, but the world, the animal kingdom has empathy, but they don't have morality. We have morality. And so, so that is a, a motivation for caring for the poor is empathy, but as Christians, we need to go beyond just empathy. There's also obligation. I should. I should do this. Which again, it's better. God commanded it, so we should do it. Better, but it's still not the, the best of motivations for us. Uh, wanting to please God and bring Him glory. Now there's a good motivation. It was outside of ourselves. I want to please God, but I'm, gr I'm grateful for what God did for me, and I'm going to return that favor because I love him, and so I'm going to show gratitude. I want to please him. I want to bring him glory. Uh, we want people to come to God. God yeah, if I can do this, then somebody else will have a relationship with God like I have a relationship with God. I want them to know God like I know God, and that motivates us. That's a good reason. And then lastly, compassion or love that flows from God's love. This is at the core of everything. It, it, it should be that we have a different kind of love than the world has because we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit produces in us fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all these fruits of the Spirit that have come from the Holy Spirit indwelling us, not because of something that we are manufacturing. Like, oh, I have to love, so I'm going to love. Oh, I should love, so I'm going to love. No, I love because he first loved me, and he's living in me, and he's transformed me, and he's made me into his, into his child, and therefore I can't not love. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ controls us. We can't not do this. We can't not care for you because 
God's love is controlling everything we do because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. If we are new creatures, if we have been changed by Jesus' death and resurrection and the Holy Spirit indwelling us, then we are going to love not like the world loves. We're going to love differently. Uh, and uh, so if you don't have that kind of love, I encourage you to, to, to dwell on how much you've been forgiven. Just spend time thinking about how much you don't deserve God's love and how much he sacrificed for you. As we sit at his feet and we listen to him and we, and, uh, and we appreciate how great our sin is and how much he died to cover that sin and pay the price for that sin. And then we think about what he's done, how he's done that for everybody else around us. So we weren't deserving it, uh, and, and they weren't deserving it. So why should I withhold love from somebody else? Why should I think that I'm better than they are, or even better than God? Because if, if I'm saying God loves them, but I don't have to, I'm saying I'm better than God. Jesus says, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And it's whoever thinks they've been forgiven. If we think that we're so good that God's, yeah, God didn't, re, didn't need much grace for me. He needs a lot of grace for them, but for me, he didn't need that much grace. Not pretty good. Then we're going to love a little. But if we recognize that we are deep sinners, deeper sinners than anybody else, and that we didn't deserve his love, then we're going to love greatly like he loves greatly. So it's these action steps, is not, I'm not going to take time on them. We're just going to go through them pretty quickly. Uh, what should you do? How, what should you take away from this and start practicing? One, serve other people secretly and openly. Okay, you don't, and Jesus is not saying that everything you do has to be secret. It can be openly and secretly, but do both. Okay? Uh, start serving people secretly and openly. And then, prayerfully reflect on your motives. As I'm serving... And it's really as easy to check when we're serving secretly, prayerfully, you know, God, what are my motives here? Why am I doing this? Why is this hard for me not to tell people what I did? Is it that I really care more about myself than I care about others and than I care about you? So prayerfully reflect on your motives. And then three, confess any impure motives. And yeah, I am selfish. And we all are. Okay. Uh, God, I'm, I'm selfish and I had an impure motives here. I want people to know how good I am. Confess that thing. Submit it. And then fourth, ask the Holy Spirit to produce his fruit in you. Lord, replace that selfishness. Replace that pride with your humility and, and fill me with your love. May your Holy Spirit just produce that fruit in me. And then fifth, sit at the feet of Jesus. Just spend time with him. Just spend time with Jesus because that's the only way we, we can become like him. We're being called to be disciples of him, for him to be our master and for us to look more and more like him. We can't do that if we don't spend time with him. So sit at his feet and allow him to be transforming us. And, and, and we think about how much he loved us and we read his word about how much he cares about us. And how he cares about other people. Just sit at his feet. And lastly, which is just like the first, repeat. Serve others secretly and openly. So, yeah. I serve other people. I analyze my motives with God. And then I, I confess. And I ask him to help me to do it better. To do it as he wants me to do it. Out of his love. And then keep going and do it. Do it out of his, with his love. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you loved us, even when we didn't deserve it. Uh, while we were still sinners, you died for us. Your, your good news is great news that we can have a restored relationship with you. And that even though we sin, 
and have sinned, no matter how bad it is, your son died for that. And you love us so much that you still are allowing us to have a relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to want to share that good news with others, whether that is through acts of service and kindness, because it's your kindness that leads us to repentance, and we want people to repent and know you. So help us to serve others, help us to give, help us to pray for our enemies, as we've been talking about other weeks. Help us to love like you love. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.